Welcome, I'm Mike Penfold, and it's a pleasure for me to chat with you today. I do volunteer work for an organization called R Montana, and we've had a lot of interest in the Bozeman Trail for some time. And I certainly look forward to having a discussion and telling a few stories of people along the old trail. And I hope you'll find it interesting about the people who migrated, immigrated here, and the people who populated the Americas. Whether it's our first Americans or the Europeans who pulled up roots and migrated west along the Bozeman Trail, uh, these people uh, were pretty interesting and had a lot of courage to see what's going over the next ridge. Um, maybe they were looking for gold, maybe they were looking for furs, maybe they were looking for a new life, but they were willing to risk all to, to follow that trail. We're going to talk about a few stories today. The Bozeman Trail is a project that we're working on with the Fort Phil Kearney uh, Bozeman Trail Association in Wyoming. We're trying to get this trail, which I think you're going to find really warrants being uh, designated as a National Historic Trail. So much happened along this trail, and uh, it takes congressional action to get it to happen, so we're working hard to try to get the Congress to designate this National uh, this Bozeman Trail is a National Historic Trail. A little bit about the Bozeman Trail. It uh, was a short-lived trail, really. It's the last gold rush trail in the United States. And basically it started over at Fort Laramie, over here in this part of Wyoming. Crosses uh, through a lot of really nice wild country in Wyoming. Uh, going by Sheridan and Buffalo and some of those communities, comes into Montana in the Crow Reservation, uh, goes through Fort Smith, um, comes through Billings at one time, and Joliet, uh, Absorkey, Big Timber, Livingston, Bozeman, and on to Virginia and Panic City. We think uh, this trail should have a lot of tourist interest. We like to, we like to encourage tourism, uh, our, our, our organizations. And one thing is that we, we like to preserve this history, but the other thing is that uh, tourists uh, tend to be good visitors. They, they, uh, they have a little more money. They travel in groups often. They tend to stay longer. They're interested in the culture of our communities and our countryside. They like to stay in accommodations, and they spend more money, frankly. Uh, so it's a, it's a good uh, tourism group to have. And the question that, that we have about the Bozeman Trail is who, who made the first trails that we now call the Bozeman Trail? And let's go way back, and I'm going to give you my opinion on, on that. Uh, the Pleistocene was the last ice age, uh, and there may have been some people who worked their way along the coast to come into the Americas. The archaeologists are still debating that. But what we do know is that North America, the northern part of North America, was covered with ice during the Pleistocene. It was impossible for people to come through this area. As the climate began to warm and the ice began to pull back, a corridor first opened up along the east face of the Rocky Mountains down through here. Now there may have been a, uh, an isolated human population in this part of Alaska during the Pleistocene where they were also cut off from Siberia. So we th I think archaeologists pretty much agree that there were people living in this, in this uh, part of what we now call Alaska. But as the climate warmed, this corridor began to open up along the east face of the Rocky Mountains and it provided a way for elk who were, who habitated in this area, not down here at that time, to start migrating, and other animals to start migrating along the east face of the Rocky Mountains. And where there was huntable wildlife, people would also come, and surely they did. So they started mig migrating down into, into what we now see as the United States, where elk and huntable animals were, humans came too. And it was along the east face of the Rocky Mountains. Beartooth and Rocky Mountains probably looked like this as the glaciers began to melt. The Beartooths were covered with ice. Probably the green areas began to open up. This, this might have been what the Stillwater River 
looked like or maybe Paradise Valley at one time as the ice began to to pull back. The, these first humans that came into our area, I, you know, I, I can't help but think about a band of hunters standing above the Yellowstone River 13,000 years ago, looking down on woolly mammoths and the kind of animals that were here at that time, thinking about how they could kill meat for their families who were who were probably living in caves where they found them. The wildlife and the things that the people hunted were amazing and had to had to protect themselves from were amazing. And that and that in that period of time you had sloths and large lions and saber toothed cats and and um, uh, there was a species of bison larger than the bison that we have now. These guys are, are, are went as, uh, extinct along with all these other amazing animals. The saber two cats were here in our area, and this guy, you think about slicing and dicing, he could do with those with those teeth. What a predator he was! The the the, the animal that really intrigues me more than anything is a short-faced bear. I mean, this guy's huge, and uh, you know, one of our black bears could have walked under his tummy without even scratching any any hair. This gives some proportion of the size of of that bear compared to human beings. He had longer legs, probably could run 40 miles an hour. Uh, he was an amazing critter. This is what his skull looks like. Look at the canine teeth on this guy. Ouch. Um, what a predator he was. And then look, here, here's his nasal cavity. And um, uh, his olfactory area in his head was larger than what we see in our bears now. So he had amazing way ability to sniff out things and follow scents of meat and probably, probably humans. I'm kind of glad this guy's not around anymore. You'd need more, more than a little Tinkerbell on your backpack if you had these guys to face. The people probably, uh, to a large extent, they live in caves. The Cheyenne tell stories about the ancient people, and they say that the buffalo were meat eaters in those days. Those early people were afraid of the meat eaters uh, so that people had to live in caves for protection. I can imagine a bear, short-nosed bear would be one of the reasons why uh, those um, people lived in, in caves back then. They, they hunted mastodons and mammoths. Actually, there's a kill site over in Wyoming, um, a, a couple of kill sites over there where they have found stone tools in, in a mix, the bones of, of uh, mammoths, uh, stone weapons. And killing an animal like this with a stone weapon is hard to imagine, isn't it? I, the, they they kind of think maybe that they killed, wounded the young ones and got them into a place where they could, uh, the weakened animal could be finally terminated. Another theory is that they uh, did a, a hit and run like this. Don Werner, the uh, vet here in Laurel, showing the comparison of a, a femur for a, for a Colombian mammoth to a a bison. Other things that were kind of interesting about the humans at that time. This is a chap by the name of Ben Stein, and in the 1960s he was digging gravel out of a uh, out of out of a gravel bed up by Wilsaw, which is also on the Bridger part of the Bozeman Trail. And this was on the Ansac Ranch, and and as he was digging, he saw something red coming out of the bank where his where his digger was. And so he stopped and got out and looked, and he found that, uh, sure enough, there was stuff there. One is a lot of red ochre. Red ochre is a iron compound that Indians would gather for 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 um, tinting things, as well as stone tools and also some bones. He had the good sense to call the archaeologist, and. Um, the archaeologists dug out something like a hundred stone artifacts, and there was also other material there that they could carbon date. They found that this burial was almost 13,000 years old. That's the oldest 
human burial in the United States. What I find interesting about some of those tools is this piece of obsidian obviously uh, came from uh, Yellowstone Park and it's certainly a Clovis type tool. And this is a piece of chert that came from the Pryor Mountains. Now the Pryor Mountains are 200 miles from where this burial was found. So people were going back and forth along what we now call the Bozeman Trail or Bozeman Trail Corridor uh, back 13,000 years ago. And the Clovis were extremely good at developing uh, very, very good uh, weapons like, like these. Several years ago, uh, Indian people who were very much aware of this ancient child burial decided that it, the bones should be reburied. They only found partial bones of the child and it, it was important to the Indian people that these bones be put back where the child was first found so that the child could be um, uh, all together in one spot. It was a very moving ceremony. Uh, songs were sung and Indian prayers were said in native languages and um, people participated in reinterring the bones uh, very close to where the original bones were found. <clears throat> My friend Howard Bogus, a Crow Indian, put a um, eagle feather on the grave after the people walked away and said a few words himself. Um, it, it's interesting, as we walked back to our vehicle from this site, we found many, many Indian rings on the ridge right above uh, teepee rings, stone circles above uh, this grave site. It's interesting that the DNA from this child is very similar to our current, some of our current Indians as well as people in Siberia. So they are learning a lot about these first immigrants from the DNA where we find, where they find it. Pictograph Cave is another place where the Bozeman Trail came by and they found hu human occupation in that cave right outside of Billings here uh, that goes back 9,000 years. The trail crosses through here and um, uh, and, and the reason it does is, one, is because of the cave, but there also the, the Yellowstone River uh, has several islands in the river right close to here, right below this, this drainage, where people could cross with their horses. So we find a lot of things along the Bozeman Trail, or at least within that Bozeman Trail corridor. Here's a cave in the Priors. Again, uh, human occupation going back uh, to almost 10,000 years. They found a fire hearth in here with carbon in it that they could date back that far. BLM has now gated this so you can't go in into this. We were glad to see that. Indians marked a lot of their trails with stone markers, big piles of rock like, like this. Um, um, and and those, those rock markers would go to significant places that the Indian used. This is Demijohn Flats in the Priors. And uh, Demijohn Flats has many, many stone circles or Indian teepee rings. And it's a big flat that people would migrate as the snows left the Priors. They would come up and camp here. The, um, we found a trail marked with stone markers going up to Demijohn Flats. The point is, a lot of the Indian trails were marked with stone markers. Here's stone markers uh, uh, going into Bighorn Canyon. Some of these are huge. This, this one here is about the size of a pickup truck. Kind of hard to get the dimensions, but they're, these are very huge. Here's another one. How many years did it take for people throwing a rock down and then another rock down to get these piles that big? Hundreds of years these trails have been used. Jim Bridger uh, was aware of these markers on uh, on trails. Here's another one. Some places you could kind of see where the travoy marks. After the Indians had horses, they used travois to carry their he heavy goods. Before that, they used big dogs. But in, the, in some places, you can actually see kind of where the travoy dragged the ground. Howard Bogus and I uh, did a lot of work on the Bozeman Trail. We used the immigrant diaries to try to get a very good location of where the Bozeman Trail actually went through Montana. 
what we began seeing is Indian markers or trail markers, or markers that could have been Indian trail markers, similar to this one uh, uh, here. Uh, here's another one. And these are right along the where we concluded the Bozeman Trail went. So what, what you found is that no immigrants in their diaries, which were often in good detail, s said anything about marking anything. They didn't put take the time to mark uh, stone markers. They were going 15, 20 miles a day through this rough country. So they didn't have time to mark trails, although they did talk in, in some detail about where they were. They didn't mark, we can't find any indication that Bozeman Trail travelers marked their trails with rock cairns like this. So we concluded that Bozeman was following old Indian trails. Right here in Billings, we have a, a pretty interesting area. Uh, Bozeman was following, we believe, the old Indian trails and which brought him to Pictograph Cave in that area in, the, in our South Hills. Um, what, a, what a challenge they were. Um, a di one of the diaries was kind of interesting. It was July 6, 1864. Quote, we had to wait a while in the morning for the men to fix the wagon. We came upon a very steep place about noon. Uh, the road had been over hills. When we came to some of the roughest, wildest looking hills we have had to pass over. I've been sleeping in the back and Billy waked me up and asked me to get out and walk. <laughs> yeah, Billy was afraid to shoot, that, that they were going to come off the, off the ridge and you, and you get over in the South Hills and some of it is extremely um, scary to bring wagons down. Remember that ice corridor that opened up along the east face of the Rocky Mountains. Here's a here's a aerial picture. It goes from Calgary all the way almost down to Denver. And here's the Rocky Mountains here all the way down. Uh, if you're looking at, uh, here's, a, here's the um, Bighorn Mountains right here. This would be the Priors right here. Uh, uh, Red Lodge would be right in here someplace. Um, but what's interesting is uh, <coughs> Bozeman Trail comes right through here. This this part is right on the this part is right on the Bozeman Trail. For centuries, people traveled along the east face of the Rockies. Chief brings down the sun. Told Clint Walker, hundred years ago, my father told me it originated in the migration of a great tribe of Indians from the distant north to the south, and has been used by Indians ever since. Uh, the Indians recognized this was an old this was an old trail. I would name for the trail. They call it an Indian language uh, where the trail goes south. And these trails were used for immigration, for commerce, for war, for moving with the seasons, cooperation, and all all kinds of things. When gold was discovered in 1862 at Grasshopper Creek in Bannock. The first stampede of miners reached uh, Alder Gulch in June of 1863. The population swelled to 10,000 people or less. Uh, a fellow by the, by the name of John Bozeman showed up. He had left his family in the area of Pikes Peak in Colorado and uh, came to Montana really to fleece the miners. He was not a miner. John Bozeman and John Jacob, Jacobs figured out that it would be smart to have a trail that was more direct coming from Fort Laramie rather than going up into Idaho and coming back back uh, into Montana to come down along the Yellowstone River and directly over to Fort Laramie. So Bozeman and John Jacobs and John Jacobs' daughter who was uh, well, seven or eight or maybe even a teenager, the three of them took off in the spring of 1873 to, to explore the possibility of bringing a wagon train and a shorter route uh, to the gold camps. It's kind of interesting that there was other miners there who were who had gotten cabin fever during the winter time and 
and and they they left at about the same time Bozeman did, uh, which and which was called the which they called themselves the Yellowstone Expedition, and they were going to look for gold along the Yellowstone River and its and its tributaries. So you have John Bozeman and John Jacobs and uh, and this Yellowstone ex Expedition all leaving the gold camps coming east. You think about John Bozeman and Jacobs exploring this wild country, thinking about bringing a wagon train through it. I mean, you're talking about 700 miles of uh, distance and thousands and thousands of acres of wild country to, to bring a wagon train through. They made one pass through this huge country <clears throat> with the idea of bringing a wagon train through. Granville Stewart was, uh, or James Stewart, who was the brother of Granville Stewart, was a part of that Yellowstone expedition that left at the same time to explore the Yellowstone River. Uh, one of the people on that expedition said that uh, later, if we'd stayed on the Indian trails, we'd have saved several days. So they were aware that there were Indian trails that, that went, left the country. Gosh, one of the, this is a whole interesting story on its own. These guys got captured, caught by a tribe of Indians. They were probably Crow. And they kept them uh, secured at night. And the, the men with the Yellowstone expedition wondered what was going to happen. They had taken their guns. And Lord knows what's going to happen. In the morning, though, one of the Indians brought a basket that had a rattlesnake in it. And one of the men with the Yellowstone expedition reached in casually, grabbed the, uh, the rattlesnake, put it around his neck, or handled it. And uh, that so impressed the Indians that this guy had big medicine that they let him all go. Uh, but that was not the end of their adventure. Uh, one night later, when they were sleeping, they were attacked by another band of Indians. Several of the miners were killed. Um, in the morning, uh, they they found their, their horses were gone. Most of their supplies were gone. A couple of them had uh, firearms yet because they had uh, fought off the Indians in the middle of the night. But one of the guys was wounded in the stomach, and uh, what an awful thing. So here they are in the middle of Indian countries, hundreds of miles from any any hope or help or anything else, and uh, one of the guys is shot, and he's going to die. He knows he's going to die. So he talks to his comrades, and he says, Guys, I know you've got to leave, and I can't go, and I'm not going to make it, so I'm going to have to end it here. So they all say goodbye to the poor guy. Uh, they give him his... Uh, nobody was wants to shoot him, so he has to shoot himself to end it. So he takes the gun, and after everybody says goodbye, he puts it to his head and pulls the trigger, and it doesn't go off. So they have to go through the, all that again. But anyway, Stuart and those people did make it um, over to Fort Laramie, and then eventually they got back to uh, Virginia and Bannock City. It's interesting, too, that they had seen in the distance three horsemen. And uh, the three horsemen, looking from a distance, had seen this group of 23 men on their horses. Uh, uh, John Bozeman figured, well, hey, these are these are these are Indians. We got to get out of here, and they did. So they hid from these guys who were actually their comrades from uh, uh, from uh, Virginia City. Jim Bridger had trapped all these streams uh, along the Beartooth Front, and and he really knew the country extremely well. So compared to Bozeman, Jim Bridger knew the country. He had the good sense to take the first wagon train at the same time that John Bozeman was taking a first wagon train. Bridger took it around the west side of the Bighorn Mountains where the Indians would not be troublesome. Bridger even tr uh, wintered sometime close to Billings here at one time. Bozeman took one sweep through the country and, w and led a wagon train. Bridger knew the country and he knew where to bring a wagon train. This emphasizes the idea that Bozeman's route was really Indian country. Think about that history. The, the, the Sioux had been pushed from the Midwest clear up against uh, 
uh, the Black Hills and, and the Dakotas, and they, they saw the area of the Bozeman Trail as their last hunting grounds, and they really understood well what happens when white immigrants come into the countryside, bring their cattle, settle their land, start growing crops, and that was the end of the Indian way of life. Uh, when the when the military built forts along the Bozeman Trail, basically breaking the treaty uh, at uh, Fort Smith, Fort Phil Kearney, uh, and Fort Fetterman, uh, the Indians put those forts under constant attack. Uh, Fort Phil Kearney was um, was just horribly, I mean, the soldiers had to go out and cut wood and were in constant, under constant attack. They had to cut hay for their horses for the winter time, and uh, so, so they were very vulnerable. Uh, so the, so Red, Chief Red Cloud uh, was a Sioux, uh, and he, he was a really great leader because he kept up a constant fight against those forts and their in their ceded territory. One of the great epic events on the Bozeman Trail was the Fetterman uh, fight. Uh, <laughs> and it's, it's a long, interesting story, too. If you haven't been to Fort Phil Kearney, it's really worth going over and see. But basically, uh, a Fetterman got wiped out uh, when he got suckered into an ambush. Uh, and Crazy Horse was there and helped participate in that in that, in that, what we now call the ma massacre. Actually, it was a, it was a good battle. We did a study of a battle uh, that happened in probably the 18, early 1860s. Basically, what happened was that the um, uh, Sioux, Arapaho, Cheyenne decided that they needed to uh, take care of the Crow situation. The Crow and these other tribes were in constant battles. And, and after a couple of battles where the Sioux got a whipping from the Crow, uh, they decided to put together an alliance of the, all of these tribes over, the, over a year or so. <clears throat> and they, and these, this alliance gathered up at Little Goose Creek over in Wyoming and uh, invaded into Sioux country for the purpose of wiping out the Crow tribe. They would have taken the young kids and they would have, they would have taken the women, made them Sioux and members of their own tribe or, or slaves. And, uh, and uh, then they would have the great country that the Crow occupied. So they came in with a great invasion force and had a big battle over on Prior Creek, which is a epic story in itself. We did we did a we did a detailed study of the of the fight and uh, the the Crow elders did have stories that their fathers and grandfathers had told them about this about this fight. Sur we surveyed the area and uh, wrote quite a detailed report for the National Park Service on this battle site. Another epic story is about Nelson's story. Who was the first drover that brought cattle into the country? Uh, Nelson's story came in uh, as a miner in 1873, and he actually made some money. He was a pretty tough guy. Matter of fact, he had a guy who was trying to jump his claim, and he shot him. But at any rate, he ended up with a considerable amount of dough and went to Texas and bought uh, Longhorn cattle. And um, uh, he bought... 3,000 uh, 3, Texas Longhorns and hired 27 really tough cowboys and he, he armed them with the best repeating rifles that they had at the, at the time and then he headed them north out of Texas and it was quite a arduous journey to bring cattle up. They had originally had intended to sell the cattle in Sedalia, Missouri but Jayhawkers in Kansas uh, were stealing herds and Story could not keep the herds on Indian country in Oklahoma. So he decided to bring them on up to the gold fields. So he came to Fort Laramie and, um, 
and then into Wyoming, Fort Phil Kearney brought them up that far. But the Indians were, were raising hell with the army there. So the fort commander felt that it was too dangerous for Story to take his cattle on through. So he asked him, to, directed him <coughs> to keep your cattle here until you, until you can be properly escorted. Well, and by the way, uh, Story, you have to keep your cattle away from the fort because we need every bit of grass here for our cavalry horses in the winter time. So Story had to keep his cattle way off from the, from the from the fort. Sioux Indians one night came in and stole a bunch of his cattle. Story got his cowboys together and tracked those Indians down, killed a couple of them, got the cattle back and brought them back. But Story got the message then, hey, we got to move on. So he snuck his cowboys out of the fort at, uh, in the mi middle of the night and uh, started heading his cattle north. And um, it was the first first significant herd of cattle ever brought into uh, into Montana. Here's for this kind of country around Fort Kearney where they where they had to keep the cattle. Interesting thing, above the Stillwater River is um, between Stillwater and Bridger Creek, we found these stone monuments here, stone structures. And the, the rancher told us that uh, these had been built by Nelson Story as defensive structures. I talked to Nelson Story's great-great-granddaughter, whose great-grandfather had taken her up here and told her that these had been built by Nelson Story's cowboys. But anyway, it's a great grass area where you could keep cattle for some time, a lot of good water and so on. And um, uh, the story is that they've seen, they've seen a lot of Indian signs, so they decided to keep the cattle here for a while before taking them down into the Yellowstone River Valley. Yellowstone River Valley. There's a rock monument up there, like shown here. It's got a lot of old cowboy signatures. Apparently, there was a rock here that had Nelson Story's signature on it at one time. Another little story about the Bozeman Trail. Another grave, I told you about one burial on the Bozeman Trail back to eight, eight, uh, 13,000 years ago. Here's a more recent one, Baby Florence. One day when we were tracking out the trail, we found what looked like a grave. It was small. And this picture doesn't show it too well, but it had flat stones over the top of it. Uh, you could see where the stones had been taken out of a little ridge there to be placed on that. So we, we were aware that that probably, probably was a burial. Um, we, um, several years later, we got a note from the Stillwater County historian that said, hey, we got this diary, people said, and wondered if we were aware of any burials along the Bozeman Trail in our area and said, hey, yeah, as a matter of fact, we were. Well, the story is that, that the wagon train got up, up uh, got in that area. That there's a little child by the name of Florence, a year, two, year, year and a half old, uh, that had gotten sick. And uh, they called it brain fever. And the wagon train stopped to, get, to, to give it the child a chance to maybe survive. Well, the child didn't. It died in the middle of the night. Um, the, the immigrants pulled a few boards off the wagons. They made a little coffin for the child. They dug, dug a hole and buried the child. And then they put flat rocks over the child's grave so that the wolves would not dig her up. Well, we think this was the grave, so we, we, we had a, a little uh, uh, memorial uh, made for her. There was still family from the Midwest who had sent the diary, and they came out, and so we had a little ceremony uh, for little Florence French, who was, um, we said, a little pioneer lies at rest here, Bozeman Trail, 1864. Songs were said, and prayers were read, and um, again, my uh, crow friend put a eagle feather on the on the grave just like he had for the little child that died 18 uh, 13,000 years before another story that's I think fairly interesting has to do with 
the Thomas Party. Uh, this was 1866. Thomas was kind of a preacher uh, that had lost his wife and two daughters during the plague and so he decided to sell his farm which he did and he and a hired man and his son headed out on the Oregon Trail. When they got to um, Fort Laramie they decided to hook up with a group of miners who, was, who were going to head for Virginia City. Um, actually this is not an accurate picture because Thomas had a good team of mules rather than, than these oxen. But the miners had oxen, which were slow in moving, and the mules, uh, he had a hard time keeping the mules uh, at a pace that was c uh, convenient with, for the oxen. So when they got to Fort, uh, uh, Fort Smith, crossed the Yellowstone River, a couple of miners got drowned there, and he, he did the service uh, for those miners as they were buried. And he and his son and the hired man took off up the Bozeman Trail following the tracks of previous wagon trains. Um, interesting that they stopped in one place and they found a spring of water uh, that they stopped for a whole part of a day to dig out so that when the miners got there with their stock they would have good fresh water to, to um, for their stock and for their uh, purposes. Thomas wrote a diary and in the diary he said quote for a moment I stand gazing at the lofty peaks now at the rugged, rugged rocks while my mind runs even then at the wild scenes of nature that spread before my eyes I'm meditating upon the adventure that I'm about to take summing up the danger cold chills run through my blood when Thomas got to the Yellowstone River, they celebrated because now they were safely in Crow Country. And um, they celebrated by opening up a bo bottle of champagne and eating some oysters. The hired man went down to the river and was catching fish. That's when some Indians try showed up, probably Blackfeet, killed them all. When the miners came through, uh, they found found them passed away. Thomas had 14 arrows in him. Uh, the, little, the little boy was killed too. The miners picked up some of the remains which are now in the Montana Historical Society. Uh, and this is a this is mark this grave is marked now along interstate uh, <coughs> close to uh, Big Timber. Well that's some of the stories about the Bozeman Trail and uh, it would be fun to talk more, but I know I could, I could talk for days on this subject. I think the important thing is that any help you can give us in getting the Bozeman Trail designated as a National Historic Trail would be appreciated. It has been a pleasure chatting with you about the Bozeman Trail. We continue to work on getting the Bozeman Trail designated as a National Historic Site. It's important that we let our congressional delegations know that this is important to tourism, our history, and our economic development for tourists in our, in our part of the state. 